Gibson is for sale. Well, kinda. Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. That's right, if you're rich enough, you can buy Gibson. The sign, that is. A viewer of the show sent me this three days ago, where you can buy the actual sign that was on the Gibson Memphis factory. Which, just in case you're not familiar, from 2001 till about 2018, 2019, they made the electric Spanish models in that factory at that point in time. So we're talking things like the 335, the 330s, anything that had F-holes and construction very similar to that, they made it there, and they also had kind of a cool retail center. I never personally visited here, however, it just seems to be kind of like what the Gibson garage was today, but maybe not quite is grandiose, but apparently there's some pretty cool stuff in here, like when are they gonna sell the giant Lucille? But anyways, if you're not familiar, Gibson shut that down when new ownership came in, so we're talking kind of a transitional period around 2019. That's why things like the ES-235 that we talked about in this episode came out and was gone as soon as it was there. Its whole history is behind, you know, them shutting it down and moving everything down to Nashville where they're making them yet today, within the custom shop, I do believe. So that's one of the main reasons why ES guitars have a long wait list, because Gibson's still kind of transitioning to where they're making their guitars now and certain finishes like natural have been proving very difficult to get right. But slowly and surely, they're getting things up and running, right? But on top of this factory sat a giant Gibson sign that was all illuminated and they had to take it down. But just this week, it pops up on Craigslist for sale by Matthew Mahler. And he says he's the maintenance and facilities manager for Gibson USA in Nashville. So apparently Gibson tried to relocate the sign to Nashville to put it on that factory. Because I'm not sure how expensive building this from scratch, custom commissioning the job would cost. I can't imagine it'd be too cheap. But they didn't just want to throw it away, so they were trying to use it. But apparently the Nashville factory is too close to the airport and the sign was too bright. It looks like they've got their runways right here. It's about 11 minute drive, five miles away. Yeah, I guess I could see how a giant super illuminated sign could mess with some things. However, my first thought was, why don't they just put the sign up and not have lights or maybe just do other types of lights in it? So I don't know if these take like a very specific light bulb and they don't work with anything else, but currently all the bulbs have been removed. It doesn't sound like they're coming with it. I don't know, maybe they are, but they're claiming everything was functional when it was taken down. And the approximate measurements are 20 feet by 20 feet, which I'm a little bit confused by because if this is 20 feet this way, it doesn't look like it's quite 20 feet tall, but maybe you have to take into account like certain brackets or something, I don't know. But if you want this bad boy, you're the one that has to arrange the shipping. They're not going to do that again. And you know it's legit because it says you have to pay Gibson Brands, not Matthew. But to make the shipping process easier, apparently it comes in three pieces. You've got the big G, which I wonder, would they just separate the big G? Because that's kind of like the Gibson logo sometimes too. I could see some guy just hanging this up on his shed. Or perhaps a doctor's office would just want IBS because if you've got some issues, they've got your solutions. <laughs> And I guess we've got more jokes here. On would be your next section. So that's kind of hilarious because that was going to be my next question. Who is this even for? I mean, jokes aside, this would be great for like a museum or like a really diehard collector like Joe Bonamassa. I don't know if he has room for this in his apartment or one of his nerdville locations, I guess you could call it. Because let's face it, this takes up a lot of real estate, but maybe a store would like it. I mean, obviously. It's a real attention getter piece. After the initial email alerting me to this, I had a couple other people be like, hey, you should buy this for your future museum. And it's like, you know, if it's too bright for the airport, it's probably just too bright for anywhere that I would want to put it. Unless we could put some other light bulbs in it. But my end goal with my museum would be to have a pretty stellar mini golf right beside it, you know, so it's sustainable in my local market other than just guitar enthusiasts visiting me. So having a giant illuminated Gibson sign would be kind of cool, but I don't know, there might be some legal things behind that. But wait until you hear the price, $25,000. Now I'm sure most of you are going like $25,000, wow. But let's put things into perspective. This is half the price of one of those greenie packages that sold out on the first day. So in Gibson's term of things, this is small fries. They're probably like, this is a steal at 25. Maybe somebody will want it. Now granted, if you needed to free up some cash, you could probably sell that greenie Les Paul a heck of a lot faster than the $25,000 Gibson sign. However, this is part of Gibson history. It is Gibson memory. 
Memphis. It's no longer there. So I could see in like 50 years this showing up on like some pickers show that, oh yeah, this was the the Gibson Memphis factory sign. I bought it so long ago and now it's just been in my barn forever. I value that at a million dollars or something crazy like that. But you have to have some serious storage capabilities. <laughs> That's all I got to say. And you know, maybe if I was a bigger fan of Gibson Memphis, like, yeah, they had some cool guitars, but I'm mainly Les Paul, so I'm all about the Kalamazoo or Nashville. So Memphis history doesn't really excite me as much, but maybe I could be convinced to buy just the big G. <laughs> but hey, this episode's a little bit short, so let's do some guitar hunting. All right, so today I ran across a listing by Norm's Rare Guitars. It's a 2020 Gibson Custom Shop Les Paul Standard in something called Golden Poppy Burst. I had to do a double take on this thing because naturally when I see these things for the first time, it's a smaller thumbnail and I gotta click on it. Like this t-shirt, that's really cool. Is that what I think it is? A BFG? Oh my goodness, it is! It's a BFG! <laughs> Sorry for the little detour here, we'll get back to that other one. That's a really cool jacket, it's got Gibson buttons too. I've never seen one of these before. Yeah, I'm gonna make an offer on that. But anyways, small photo. I could have swore this was like an early 90s model because that's exactly what their tobacco sunbursts look like. But they call this one Golden Poppy Burst. So it's a lefty R9 at a little under 6,000 bucks. That's not too bad shopping at a name brand dealer. But being left-handed, obviously, it's not for me. But the color caught my attention. But ooh, the Gibson logo even matches pretty well. It's all nice and aged. However, besides just the finish here, I think it's the black plastics that really transform the vibes of this, similar to the way that happens on Gold Top. And then the back is really plain. It, you know, it's so strange seeing these reissue style guitars not have the really heavy aniline dies that we see on most every single reissue yet today. Like check out my anniversary R9. But it looks like this one might have a nice jatoint effect to it with the mahogany. Oh, originated from Southpaw Guitars. That's a shop that specializes in lefties. Next up here is one I clicked on because I was like, ooh, is that a nice deal? Because the initial leading photo as a thumbnail was just straight up on the TP6. So first I was questioning, are we sure that's a 1974 20th anniversary guitar? And finding a natural one would be uncommon, but it does have the inlay. It's just likely that somebody added the TP6 tailpiece. We've got the wear on the gold pickups as is common in that era. We can see a little something going on with our seam line right there. So let's look at some more photos. All right, that headstock's looking pretty beat up. But then we get to the back, it's like, yep, 1,000% a refinish. Now, sometimes in the early 80s, you kind of get this weird white grain fill stuff going on. You can see that on many a Spotlight specials. And you kind of just grow accustomed to that and you love it, but that's not what this is. That's just a, you couldn't get the white finish out of the pour. <laughs> So this likely started life as a white Les Paul custom, which, oh man, that hurts. That hurts if that is true, because white 74s are very expensive due to the Randy Rhodes affiliation. But besides the back, I would say they did a pretty good job refinishing this, because the neck, they don't have a lot of that stuff going on. And here, once again, we can see the white in here, but oh, okay. I remember why I really wanted to talk about this one with you guys. You see this right here? Somebody has routed a section out of the headstock and inlaid a different piece of wood or maybe it's even just filler. But you're probably wondering, why on earth would anybody do that? Perhaps somebody etched their social security number into the guitar. Or maybe it's just damage and they wanted to fix it. No. Here's what I think that is. There used to be factory seconds, and then there was a stamp below that called Bargain. B-G-N. And this is right where they would put it. So my guess is this started life as a Bargain one, meaning it had more issues than just a slight finish blemish like the factory seconds. Typically, it's believed these were only sold to employees and not the main market. However, there's not a lot of research out there on these. So it might be like a light seam separation like we saw on the top of this one. But here's an example where it was stamped vertically. Honestly, that's the first time I've seen that, but a lot of times you'll see it in that area. So I'm thinking that's exactly what that was. And then somebody's replaced our waffle back tuners with these modern day Grovers. But you can see it's got the pancake body construction. Everything else definitely lines up for a 1974-ish guitar. So besides the not so good refinish on the back of the body, it was kind of a interesting find here. But perhaps that's what made it a bargain in the first place. Some sort of a light seam separation. But they went 4200 bucks for it. And if you're local, you can check it out in Hicksville, New York, Sam Ash. 
This next one's just a beauty. Another one from Rivington Guitars. We talked about them a couple of nights ago. This is an 85 Les Paul Standard for 4,000 bucks. 4,000 is not too bad when you compare it to the prehistorics, but that is a good amount of money for just a regular standard. It looks like this one's got a lot of finish checking to it, but hey, flip out winding tuners. I didn't see that the first time I looked at this. And it looks like it's been refretted, so this is definitely player's grade instrument. And oh yeah, you've got the finish checking all over this thing, and it does indeed date to 1985. And you might be scared. Hey, is that a neck heel repair or something? No, that's just what they start doing in the mid 80s. And it's especially common in the 90s where they do the painted heel just because they thought it looked good. Does it look like a repair? Yeah. So I don't blame people always questioning it if they see it. So always be sure to look. But yes, that is correct for this particular color of this year. But wow, those are stock on there. You don't find the Gibson Schaller tuners too often on the regular standards of this era. I like the ultra age speed knobs going on here too. And it looks like you have the original Tim Shaw's yet. And the last one for our journey tonight is something I was kind of interested in. 2005 Gibson Les Paul Custom Shop, but obviously One Piece Top catches my attention. 4,000 bucks also catches my attention. Gibson doesn't do One Piece Tops very often. Occasionally you can find them, but to find it on just a regular Les Paul Custom was kind of bizarre. I'm not gonna say it's the nicest flame top in the world. It kind of goes at a diagonal to the guitar when it's usually more properly lined up, but maybe that's just how they had to do this particular one to get the Les Paul body shape to fit on the blank. So this is one that you buy when you just want a regular custom, but you want something a little bit more special. So what's the reason I didn't buy this one? It's got a bunch of ugly dings on the top, so it's more so for a player that wants a cool story, I think, at this point, because it's definitely been used as it should have been, because it's a beautiful guitar. But maybe this lighting's just not being very flattering, because if you look, got some really direct sunlight here, so it's probably accentuating those dings more so than it should be. And the back isn't too beat up here, so I don't know, maybe I was too hard on this one, but if you can make him an offer at like 3,500 bucks, you're getting a good deal. It looks like it even has some cool case candy with it yet. However, I don't see a mentioning of a C away anywhere and I don't see it in the photos so I guess that's another thing that makes me go nah I'll probably pass but that is a cool guitar for someone all right troglodytes let me know if you buy Gibson but otherwise I'll catch you tomorrow on the next episode take care